welcome back to part two. My name's Josh Brown and I'm the Education Officer for the Rainbow Turtle Charity. We start now with Eve, Charlotte and Sean from Greif High in a room with Mari Black, Gavin Newlands and a very squeaky door. Okay, I would just like to say thank you very much again for having us today. Um, uh, we'd just like to tell you a wee bit about why Greif High School first of all support Fairtree. Uh, we support it because it gives farmers a fair price in developing countries. Um, there's a guaranteed minimum price with no changes each month and this increases standards of living which is very important in developing countries as we can see there's such a high rate of poverty. It uh, also ensures good working conditions for all parties involved and also helps to uh, set up cooperatives within villages so that the community can set up um, new places like so hospitals and schools. So basically we'd like to tell you about what we're doing to promote fair trade within our school and the local community. And um, So last year Greif High School won the Renfrewshire High School's Fair Trade Award and it's the first high school to ever do that and win that award. Uh, so the events we planned and held included um, a Ben and Jerry's ice cream sale and we also brought in the people from the Rainbow Turtle to sell some of the products in the school. And our biggest event last year was the Great Greif Bake Off um, where we encourage staff and pupils to bake cakes or brownies or cookies and um, using fair trade ingredients. And we had a farmer from Guatemala to come in as our judge, which was a huge success. Great High School are still very committed to fair trade and this year we're going to do a bit more. Um, we're going to hold local surveys within businesses to see what fair trade products they use and why they use them. We're also going to have a curry night within the school where a professional chef is going to come in and kind of teach us how to make curries using only fair trade ingredients. We're also going to have more fair trade stalls within school events such as parents' nights and Christmas concerts and that kind of thing. So basically in school we've been learning about UK businesses that have suppliers abroad and they're often treated not well as they should be when they're paid very poorly and they work in bad places, bad working conditions. And how do you think we could go about it, making UK companies accountable for their actions abroad? Well, so obviously some of these things can, can be dealt with through legislation if, if, mm -hmm. if a government so, cho so chose um, to do so. Um, and obviously that's up to us to pressure governments to do that. But a lot, of, a lot of what you're saying is down to education and making sure that people are aware. So you can have campaigns that, that tell you this company that um, um, pays their workers this overseas and what have you. I think the more people are educated, uh, the better choice they can make. Well, as part of our role to educate, we thought it would be good to explain, first of all, the Millennium Development Goals. And I found a couple of odd chaps hanging around the warehouse who said they'd like to help. The Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs, were announced at the UN Summit in 2000 in New York. All the UN member countries, 189 of them at the time, agreed to try and tackle the eight goals by 2015. That's right, 2015! Ah, jinx. The goals were... To get rid of extreme poverty and hunger. To get all primary aged kids into school. To promote equality between men and women, boys and girls. To reduce child deaths. To improve the health of mums. To combat HIV or AIDS and malaria and other diseases. To ensure environmental sustainability. And to work together, globally. As good as they might sound, the agreement was heavily criticised as it wasn't legally binding and many things like wars. Oh. Unfair trading. Oh, Jenny Mac. Discrimination. Ah, jinx. Human rights abuses. Oh, dear. Greed and injustice. Oh, those are the worst ones. Have meant that while there have been some improvements, there's still loads to be done in the world, which is where we come in. So let's head back to the Scottish Fair Trade Forum's AGM, where I asked lots of campaigners to tell me about fair trade. Graham Clark, uh, I work for SQA and I'm chair of the Scottish Fair Trade Forum. What brought me into it was the concept of fairness, the concept that it wasn't fair for people because they lived in another part of the world to be treated worse on trade and justice than if you lived down the street. I think people will continue to buy products if they're marketed and taste good, 
but it will only sustain if people also grasp the fact that the world is smaller and therefore producers and small producers who are living in an unfair world actually don't get the opportunity to share in the success that people here get. So in terms of trade, that people think beyond just their own borders and beyond their own streets. My name is Mary Alice Mansell and I belong to the Loch Winnock Fair Trade Group in Renfrewshire. Fair trade exists because there is so much unfair trade. I'm originally Irish, so I haven't lived there for a very long time. In the 1840s, 50s, there was an appalling famine in Ireland. Possibly two million people died of starvation. During those years, the potatoes rotted all over Europe, but there were bumper wheat harvests, for example, and there was a lot of fish um, in the rivers, in the sea, and uh, the various other foods available. However, all of that food was exported to England. Food prices were able to stay low in, in, for the industrial workers in England. They had been promised cheap food to entice them to come and work in the factories, the mills, and so on. So that to me was the first example that I became aware of, of really unfair trade. And we continue to do the same throughout the world today. We in the developed countries um, have access to a vast array of foodstuffs and various commodities, um, at the, at, almost at a price of our choosing. And we have systems in place that allow us to dictate what the prices are going to be. And I consider that to be very unfair. Let's leave Stirling and go back to Paisley and to Howard, talking to the Renfrewshire Primary Schools. He told us more about life for some children in Malawi. Normally, uh, they will not have breakfast. Yeah, it's, they will not have breakfast. Uh, if any, uh, then you see if you have uh, some, if let's say in the evening you cooked some rice, then uh, you, you will not eat all of it. You spare some so that the children, before going to school, uh, they may have the, the, the rice. But it's not always. And uh, if they go to school, it's not like here where children eat at school. If they go to school, all they know is we shall go and have lunch at home. So uh, it's again not like here where uh, children are taken to school by their parents. They have to walk to school. If the school is a kilometer or so away, they have to walk to school and then walk back home. Normally they begin at around 7 a.m. and knock off at around 1. Then if there are some activities, uh, afternoon activities at school, they have to go back at around half past 2 to come back home at around half past 4. All children have to go to school, but uh, it's uh, difficult because uh, of uh, infrastructure. Let's say, for example, the school which is in my area. It's a government policy that each school should have not more than eight pupils in primary one. But then we had over we had 145 pupils who were ready to register. So the question was, where do we put these other children? So we parents went to meet the educational administrators, and then we agreed that they should be enrolled. But then the school had only one standard one teacher. How does he manage? A class of 145. Yeah, so that was another issue. Uh, fortunately, because of the pressure they got from the parents, the ministry added another teacher. So, which means now we have two classes, standard one classes, of about 70 pupils each class. 
So because of that, sometimes uh, pupils start losing interest in school when they are still young because concentration is low. It becomes difficult as a result. Most of the children lose interest in school. Here's Liam from JTS talking to the pupils from Grife. The main thing we do though is that we import the rice from Malawi and we do a 90 kilogram challenge. Oh, they've, they've done it, so you know all about it. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. So you know all about John Richards, our director, who went out and talked to a rice farmer and says, what does selling rice mean to you? And he says, if, sell, if the farmer says we sell 90 kilograms, I can send my child to secondary school for a year. You know, because uh, primary education is free, but they have to pay for secondary education. And uh, Liz and I were out actually in Malawi this summer and we visited a school, a primary school. 2,500 pupils, they had 40 teachers in 21 classrooms. And there was virtually no books at all. We actually, afterwards we went down, all, everybody was with us, there was 12 of us, just went to the local supermarket and emptied it of all the, the books that they had, all the exercise books, because they have absolutely nothing. We asked the headmaster what they were, what they were missing, and it was... Um, Books and uh, tables or the desks. They didn't have any. They had very, very few desks. But um, what we did see that the people were very happy. Weren't they? the children were really lovely people, but they just didn't have anything. I mean, quite from what we had, the poverty was a bit overpowering at times to see it. But um, for what we do in here, we sell rice. What people buy, buying the rice, you are helping people over there um, to get living. And it also kind of relates a wee bit to the news of all these people coming just now, the migrants coming over because of a, some political problem, but some economic. If we're able to help the people over there and let them get a living in their own country, then they, they don't particularly want to come to countries. Nobody wants to leave their home. So if we can help them, then it kind of helps that problem as well. For Fair Trade Fortnight earlier in the year, we had a visit from Ishmael Diaz from Guatemala a honey and coffee producer. We took him on a tour of Renfrewshire schools and he met the pupils from St Paul's Primary in Fox Bar who did an amazing piece of cross-curricular work, practicing their Spanish and telling the world about Ishmael and his story. Hola, me llamo Ismael. Hello, my name is Ismael. Soy un agricultor de miel de Guatemala. I am a honeybee farmer from Guatemala. Guatemala es un país muy bonito en América Central. Guatemala is a beautiful country in Central America. Tiene montañas, ríos y lagos. It has mountains, rivers and lakes. Todos los días camino hace las colmenas para cuidar a las abejas y sacar su miel. Every day I walk to the beehives to get to look after the bees and get the honey. Cada año producen muchas toneladas de miel. Each year they produce tons of honey. Vendemos nuestra miel con fair trade. We sell the honey through fair trade. Fair trade seguran que ganamos un sueldo justo por nuestro trabajo. Fair trade makes sure we get a fair pay for our work. Vene a Escocia para explicar a la gente la importancia de fair trade por nuestro negocio y comunidad. I've come to Scotland to tell people about my business and community. Creo que Escocia es muy bonito y me gusta la gente. I think Scotland is beautiful and I like the people. Gracias por apoyar a fair trade. Adiós. Thank you for supporting Fair Trade. Goodbye. The SDGs in 60 seconds. In 2012, the UN realised it wasn't going to hit its target. So they decided to get people together to talk about some new goals. And I'm not talking about football here now. After loads of consultation including asking us, the public, to chip in. They came up with 17 goals to be met by 2030. Number one was end poverty. Number two, end hunger. Roger Weist, we're never going to get through 17 of them in the next 60 seconds, are we? To be honest, 
I think we were a bit optimistic to set ourselves such unrealistic targets. Well, it's worth having a go, isn't it? I mean, we can't just keep giving up because it seems impossible to reach our goals. Maybe it would have been better if we hadn't put a time limit on it. Well, we'd never get it finished if we didn't give ourselves a deadline, would we? Well, we've made a right mess of it now anyway. Let's start again. To find out more about the SDGs, visit our website where you'll find all 17 of them. You can find out more too on the UN website, un.org slash sustainable development. Back in that noisy room, the pupils from St Paul's asked the MPs about the sustainable development goals. The, the next set of goals are um, about to be discussed. In my position in Parliament, I was on the committee that we've managed to get a, a debate in Parliament in, um, next Thursday on development goals. So we're hoping to, Mary and I and our party and Scottish MPs are hoping to try and um, persuade the whole Parliament that the, the, the UK position should be a strong one so that the development goals are, very, are not weak. That's where it becomes our job to keep putting pressure on people so that they do complete everything that they said they would do. So that's where it's so important that these debates that we're talking about and bringing up is saying to folk, by the way, you gave us this list of all the things you would do. You've not done that one, you've not done that one. So when are you doing them? you've received a lot of media attention since being elected. Um, how do you plan on using this to promote fair trade within Westminster? <laughs> That's a politician's question, The spotlight is on the SNP quite a lot, and it has been on myself quite a lot, so you're quite right in putting pressure on me <laughs> to be making sure that we're, we're using that to promote the right kind of messages, and if fair trade's one that we agree with, then there's no reason why we shouldn't. So don't worry, there'll be a Twitter post later on. <laughs> Getting supermarkets to stop more fair, fair trade produce will rely on consumer demand. How are you going to encourage people in local businesses and rent sure to use fair trade products? Well, we've got a voice now that we didn't have. Uh, Manny's got a slightly bigger voice at the moment. <laughs> um, the thing we can do locally is just is kind of keep promoting fair trade. I think we need to better educate people what fair trade does. It ensures that. Um, kind of farmers and producers in the country of origin get a fair price. But what it also does, is additionally, there's an extra bit of money that goes to help what community causes and build some social cohesion in these in these countries and in towns and villages. So, I think there's perhaps we could we could be better at educating. Um, and it's brilliant in schools, but I think there's yeah, there's so many adults and out there that don't that don't fully understand what first trade is. And I think it's possibly up to to us to get involved with that as well. Hello, my name is Jordan and you're listening to the Rainbow Turtle Fair Trade Podcast. Let's take one final trip to Stirling to hear the Scottish Fair Trade Forum's director, Martin Rhodes, give a rallying cry to all of us fair trade campaigners. All of us here got involved in fair trade, I'm guessing, because we believed that something had to be done about the unfairness of global trade. Something had to be done about global inequality something had to be done about global poverty. And when I was reporting to the AGM of the forum this morning, one of the things I suggest is we didn't get involved in this, any of us, I don't think, because we wanted to organise a coffee morning um, or we wanted to sit in meetings or take minutes. Why we got involved was actually we felt passionately about the issues of trade, about the issues of trade justice, about fairness in international trade. And therefore... If we are to keep renewing our movement, bringing new people involved and getting them involved, then we need to keep that focus on campaigning. This movement is not about selling more chocolate, more flowers, more wine. Of course we want to sell products in order to help the producers. But it is about something much more fundamental than that, and that needs to remain our focus. And that is about global trade justice. It's about fairness in trade. It's about challenging and questioning the systems, the processes that are in place that mean that the farmers, the workers, the producers end up not being able to feed themselves. It's about challenging that situation where we have 
textile workers working in dangerous conditions that lead to the sort of disasters we've seen in recent years and collapsing of buildings. It's about challenging the day-to-day -day inequalities, unfairness. And that's how I hope that in our campaigning, yes, we will be organizing coffee mornings and fashion shows. Don't stop doing that. We will be holding you know, stalls at events to sell products. We will be looking in terms of fair trade football competitions and all of that. But we will ensure that all of that is in the context of that commitment to taking forward that much bigger goal and achieving that much bigger goal, which is an end to that inequality of power and wealth. Let's have a final word from Howard. The best part of the day is when I am advocating for change in my community. I usually do that, especially when I talk about the importance of education. Yeah, I enjoy talking about the importance of education. I, I, I enjoy encouraging people going to school because school is the key for everything. School education is the key for development. So when I'm not on the field, when I'm not doing anything for myself, uh, I, I, I organize my fellow parents and the... Uh, uh, talk about the importance of education. I enjoy it very much. That leaves it for me to thank you for listening, to thank everyone who contributed, especially the pupils and teachers from Grife High and St Paul's Primary in Fox Park, also local musician Clark Mooney, local writer Anne Scriven, all the staff and volunteers at Rainbow Turtle, especially Colm, Ross and Lindsay. Thanks too to Mari Black and Gavin Newlands. And finally to Howard Msukwa and Ishmael Diaz. You can find out more about us and the work we do at rainbowturtle.org.uk. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, SoundCloud and YouTube. Keep an eye out for details of episode two due out in mid-November. Rainbow Turtle, putting in the day's dark to make Rich trade a scoosh for everybody. <laughs>